Hello, my name is Tom Peters. I'm a professor at the University of Iowa. Today I'm going to talk about occupational safety and health, regulations and guidelines. By the end of this module, learners should be able to describe the agencies and organizations that regulate occupational health and safety, locate regulations and guidelines relevant to a particular workplace hazard, apply occupational exposure limits to assess exposure risks. First, I want to make sure we all understand what a personal exposure measurement is. Personal means that the measurement is made at the worker. To address hazards that enter the body by inhalation, a personal measurement means that air is sampled from within the breathing zone. This talk will focus on inhalation hazards. Similar concepts can be applied to noise, radiation, and other hazards. Exposure has different meanings for different hazards. For inhalation, exposure means concentration of a substance in the air. For gases, we usually express exposure in parts of substance per million parts of air, ppm, or parts per billion, ppb. These are volume ratios. For particles, we usually express exposure as mass concentration milligrams of particles per meter cubed of air or micrograms of particles per meter cubed of air. Measurement involves the process of collecting a sample and how that sample will be analyzed. The figure at right depicts the collection of a sample to measure personal exposure to particulate matter. A belt mounted air pump pulls air through a sampler mounted on the worker's lapel the air entering the sampler comes from within the worker's breathing zone, so this is a personal sample. A filter in the sample collects particles, which can be weighed for mass. We then divide by the air volume sampled to get mass concentration, such as milligrams per meter cubed, which is then called the personal exposure of the worker. Let's consider this example exposure profile for a worker. The concentration of some contaminant was measured in the breathing zone of a worker every 15 minutes over an 8 hour shift. For now, I'm not going to give units, we'll get into that later. The ups and downs in exposure seen here are typical of many workplaces. Are these concentrations too high? Are they okay? Well, it depends on how toxic the substance is and what kind of health effects are of concern. Workplace exposure limits, OELs, help us make decisions about exposure data. The workplace occupational exposure limit is a limit that describes the upper limit of personal exposure that is acceptable risk for your company. It is set by you, the practicing industrial hygienist, or your company, for instance, Workplace OELs are typically based on exposure limits from a regulatory agency or other groups. They must be at least as stringent as the regulatory limit, but may be lower, sometimes much lower. There are many workplace agents with exposure limits. These include chemical hazards such as gases, vapors, and particles, biological hazards such as microorganisms, virus, toxins from biological sources, and physical hazards such as noise, radiation, lasers, and exposure to hot and cold temperatures. In this presentation, I focus on chemical exposures. There are several types of occupational exposure limits. Time-weighted average occupational exposure limits, or TWA OELs, are established for substances which lead to chronic, long-term adverse health effects, such as fibrosis from exposure to crystalline silica. Most exposure limits are time-weighted averages, or TWAs. The TWA OEL is an airborne concentration to which it is believed that nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed day after day for a working lifetime without adverse health effects. A short-term exposure limit, or STEL, is established for a substance that leads to acute adverse health effects. A STEL is an airborne concentration to which workers can be exposed continuously for only a short period of time. 
A ceiling limit is also for substances that lead to acute health effects. And ceiling limits are concentrations that are not to be exceeded in the workplace at any time. Let's go back and consider this exposure profile that I showed you before. We can compute the arithmetic mean exposure or the time weighted average TWA exposure. In this example I calculate the TWA exposure to be 2.3 as shown with the black dotted line. We can compare the TWA exposure to the TWA occupational exposure limit shown as the red line. In this case the TWA exposure is higher than the occupational exposure limit and we have figured out that we have a problem. We are going to have to do something to protect the worker, either provide protective equipment or apply some type of controls. What about short-term exposures? In this case, I count the peaks that are higher than the occupational exposure limit. In this case, the short-term exposure limit, or STEL. I see that concentrations exceeded the STEL one time for 15 minutes. Is this okay? Probably not. It may be within regulations and I would need to look into exactly how many excursions of the STEL are allowed within a given time period to know if this is a violation. However, I am concerned as an industrial hygienist, I would be worried and I'd want to take more measurements to see if this is typical. I generally shoot to have concentrations well below any exposure limits, say 10% of the OEL. The particular concentration established for a given OEL is based on adverse health response given a particular dose. This type of information comes from toxicology tests conducted in a laboratory on animals which the biological response of animals, typically rats or mice, is observed after applying various doses of a substance. It can also come from epidemiological studies that relate adverse health outcomes of workers to dose. Dose in this case is often measured as concentration measured in the breathing zone, again, personal exposure. This graph shows typical data obtained from a toxicological test. On the y-axis is increasing response and on the x-axis is increasing dose. Rodent tests are often conducted at very high dose to elicit a biological response that we can see in a reasonable amount of time. Here this data shows a clear increase of response with increasing dose. How do we translate these high dose rodent experiments to human populations? It is not trivial. Exposures in the workplace or other environments normally result in much, much lower doses than in rodent experiments. And people are not rodents. Their uptake and biological response is often very different than humans. We also need to consider sensitive populations. Are these healthy workers or are we trying to protect children, for example? Finally, we need to integrate these data with that from epidemiological studies. There are a lot of issues and non-trivial decisions in this process and there are groups that do this type of synthesis of toxicological and epidemiological information for us. What do we know about nanomaterials? Well, there is toxicological evidence of adverse health effects from exposure to nanomaterials. It's available for only a handful of thousands of nanomaterials that are currently in use in most cases, response has been found to relate to size, morphology, and surface chemistry. Most of what we know is for inhalation, but information on dermal exposures is emerging. Epidemiological data is very limited, with surveillance just beginning, such as the registry of nanomaterial handlers started in France. Importantly, each change to tune a nanomaterial for improved performance of a product potentially represents a new workplace hazard. So figuring out and setting workplace exposure limits is often very challenging. What is available? Well, there are, are several groups that set occupational exposure limits in the United States. The Occupational Safety and Health Administration, OSHA, under the Department of Labor, issues and enforces rules. They are the regulator. They set 
Permissible Exposure Limits, PELs. The National Institute for Occupational Safety and Health, NIOSH, under the Department of Health and Human Services within the, the CDC, Center for Disease Control, recommends limits, performs research and training, and provides testing and certification. They provide recommended exposure limits, or RELs. The American Conference of Government Industrial Hygienists is a consensus group that provides technical guidance and science-based or health-based occupational exposure limits. They provide threshold limit values called TLVs and biological exposure indices, BEIs. I'll now take some time to walk through how to find these OELs from each agency. OSHA provides permissible exposure limits PELs in the Code of Federal Regulations 29 CFR 1910.1000. In this document, you will find Table Z1, which lists the PELs by substance. Again, these PELs are the law and they are regulatory values. I'll now click on the link provided to show you the table in the web browser. So here down at the bottom I'm going to click on this this link and it's going to take me to this website from the United States Department of Labor which OSHA is a part of. If I come down I scroll down I can see that here I am at 29 CFR part number 1910 part title occupational safety and health standards subpart Z and here is table Z1 limits for air contaminants. And if I go down, I first see that there are a bunch of footnotes, and I'm going to talk about them in a bit. And I keep going down, and finally I find table Z1, and here is table Z1. And so if I look at this, the first thing in my list, the substance is acetaldehyde, and it has a cast number of 75070. So now I'm going to go back. I cut and pasted this table into my presentation. And I'm going to go back to my presentation. And here I can see table Z1 limits for air contaminants. Again, here's the substance, acetaldehyde. And here is the cast number or chemical abstract services number. The limit for this substance is 200 ppm or translating that into milligrams per meter cubed is 360 milligrams per meter cubed. In the last column I have a skin designation. And we really need to watch out for these footnotes because they're important. First of all the the number one in parentheses that footnote on both columns here with my my levels it states that these PELs are eight hour time weighted average unless otherwise noted the a means that this is parts of vapor or gas per million parts of air at a specific temperature 25 degrees C and 760 tor B means that this is milligrams of substance per meter cubed of air. So how would I actually use this table? Let's say I'm interested in what the regulatory permissible exposure limit is for acetone. I scroll down until I find acetone. From this table, I see that the time-weighted average PEL for acetone is 1,000 ppm or 2,400 milligrams per meter cubed. There are no other markings or footnotes, so I know that there's no short-term or ceiling exposure limit, and there is no skin designation, which would mean that there's some concern for dermal exposure. How about for manganese? Scrolling down to manganese, I see five milligrams per meter cubed for manganese compounds and manganese fume. I also see a C in parentheses, which indicates that this is a ceiling limit. So that five milligrams per meter cube should not occur ever in a facility that has manganese in the air.
What if I'm concerned about particles in a workplace with no PEL, say flower dust? I look through table Z1 and I don't see anything for flower. However, there's a catch-all ca category for particles called particles not otherwise regulated, or PNOR. The TWA PEL for particles not otherwise regulated is 15 milligrams per meter cubed for total dust and 5 milligrams per meter cubed for respirable dust. The basis for these PELs is that even relatively non-toxic substances can overload the defenses of the respiratory tract. We will talk more about that later, but respirable dust is the dust that can reach deep into the alveolar region of your lung when inhaled and you have different defenses there, so we want to protect that in a different way. What if I'm interested in methylene chloride? I look it up in table Z1 and I find another footnote, a 2 in parentheses. This footnote tells me to see table Z2. So this example here demonstrates how you really need to be persistent when you're looking these things up. You've got to know the footnotes, you've got to keep on digging into the documents. So table Z2 provides more information about compounds with ceiling limits. Table Z2 has a different format than table Z1, but it's still relatively easy to follow. So the first column I see is substance. So here's an example for benzene. There is an eight hour time weighted average PEL of 10 ppm, a ceiling limit of 25, and then some more definition. This is the acceptable maximum peak above acceptable ceiling concentration for an eight hour shift. So this is the peak concentration now. This is 50 ppm for an eight hour shift. And the maximum duration is 10 minutes. But there's still nothing for methylene chloride except for another footnote, which says to C1910.1052. So I go to 1910.1052 to find this. Eight hour time weighted average permissible exposure limit is 25 ppm for methylene chloride. The short term exposure limit is 125 ppm for 15 minute sampling period. OSHA defines that there should never be a 15 minute exposure over this short term exposure limit. So this type of digging is not uncommon. You need to be prepared to dig to find what you need. Here I've compiled a list of permissible exposure limits from OSHA for metals that are relevant to nanotechnology. Particles not otherwise regulated covers all particles that do not have a specific PEL based on their chemistry. Many particles used in nanotechnology fall into this category. The PEL that we found on the website for PNOR is 15 milligrams per meter cubed when measured as total dust or 5 milligrams per meter cubed when measured as respirable dust. These concentrations are very high. Dust at this level would in most cases be visible as a cloud to the naked eye. Many metals have much, much lower OELs such as 0.5 milligrams per meter cubed for soluble barium compounds that are commonly used in batteries, 0 0.01 milligrams per meter cubed for silver used as biocide, and 0 0.002 milligrams per meter cubed for soluble platinum compounds used in many applications. Sometimes limits are different for the state of the substance, like that shown for copper. The PEL for copper fume is 0.1 milligrams per meter cubed, whereas that for copper when occurring as a, a dust or mist is one milligram per meter cubed. I want to bring up titanium dioxide, a common type of particle used in nanotechnology with no specific permissible exposure limit. Thus, titanium dioxide falls into the category of particles not otherwise regulated or PNOR. We will talk more about this later. OSHA has a general duty clause, which when paraphrased states that each employer shall furnish a job 
or a workplace that are free from recognized hazards. This is a bit of a gray area, especially for nanotechnology. There are many, many types of substances for which we have no toxicology or the toxicology is just emerging. When is there enough evidence to invoke the clause? Well, it's pretty unclear. The employer shall also comply with standards, and so that means that the employers must comply with permissible exposure limits. Finally, it states that each employee shall comply with the rules and regulations. So we have uh, the employer must do things and the employee must also do things. The National Institute of Occupational Safety and Health provides recommended exposure limits, or RELs, RELs. NIOSH must take into account costs and feasibility when they propose RELs. You can find RELs in the NIOSH pocket guide, which I will go to via this hyperlink. In this NIOSH pocket guide, you can type in the particular substance that you're interested in. So here I'm going to type in silver, which searches the CDC NIOSH pocket guide and silver. I click on the first hit and then I can see this table. This table has a lot of extremely useful information in it and I'm going to take some time to review it with you. At the top of the table is the common name, in this case silver, metal dust, and soluble compounds such as AG. As AG means that we will measure dust and soluble compounds by detecting silver in the collected sample. There's a CAS number, and that CAS number stands for Chemical Abstract Service. There is also IDLH, immediately dangerous to life or health, and that is a limit in, in this case, 10 milligrams per meter cubed. I can see more information by clicking on the link. In white, I have very useful information. I have the NIOSH recommended exposure limit, the REL, and the permissible exposure limit, and they're both 0 0.01 milligrams per meter cubed. Also in this white section, I have measurement methods, and this is really great information, and it tells me how to sample and analyze that sample chemically in order to, to determine if I meet or am lower than the exposure limit. So if I click on this NIOSH method 7300, I want to show you what I get, and I get this PDF file. So if I go to this PDF, I can see that this is NIOSH method 7300, elements by ICP, and if I come down in through here, it says what elements do I analyze this, and I look in here in this silver, this is the compound that I'm interested in. This document tells me how to sample, and so here it tells me the sampler is a filter. I can use a 0.8 micron cellulose ester membrane or 5 micrometer polyvinyl chloride membrane filter at a flow rate of 1 to 4 liters per minute. It also tells me on this right side once I take that sample, how do I measure it? Well, I use inductively coupled argon plasma atomic emission spectroscopy, which is ICP-AES. It tells me how to take an ashing reagent. That means I'm going to take my filter and I'm going to get rid of the filter and only have my sample left over. It tells me different information about the analytical method. If I come down through here, I can see that there are very specific instructions for how to take that sample and also then to digest that sample. I come down at the very bottom of this document and then I also find that there are limits of detection and these limits of detection can be very useful when you're trying to figure out how long you need to sample. So LOD is the limit of detection in micrograms per filter. So that's what my method can detect on that filter. Okay, now I'm going to close this document and go back to the NIOSH pocket guide. So here I am back again uh, at the table for silver. 
below this section in white that has the exposure limits and measurement methods I can see there's physical description metal white lustrous solid there's molecular weight there's something to do on the density of the material boiling point melting point there's also if I scroll down a little bit more incompatibilities and reactivities so for instance silver is incompatible with ammonia there are exposure routes Silver is an inhalation, ingestion, skin and or eye contact hazard. Symptoms, uh, health, adverse health effects that may occur. Target or organs, the nasal septum, skin and eyes are a particular concern for silver. And then there's down below, personal protection, sanitation, what to do for skin contact, eyes. And then also at the very bottom, there is respirator recommendations. So now I close this document and I'm going to return back to the presentation. Here I just want to show you again this is the silver table from the NIOSH pocket guide and I want to highlight there are NIOSH recommended exposure limit or REL, OSHA permissible exposure limit or PEL. And there's also measurement methods which are extremely useful for figuring out how to actually take a measurement. From time to time NIOSH issues current intelligence bulletins or CIBs. They did so in 2011 for titanium dioxide, a white powder commonly used in many products such as whitener and in some sunscreens. In the CIB NIOSH reviewed current literature showing that small TiO2 particles elicit more inflammation than larger particles for a given mass dose. They considered this toxicological data in the context of the only applicable occupational exposure limit, which was the NIOSH permissible exposure limit for particles not otherwise regulated, or 15 milligrams per meter cubed. They then recommended exposure limits of 2.4 milligrams per meter cubed for fine TiO2 and 0.3 milligrams per meter cubed for ultrafine TiO2. In 2013, they issued another current intelligence bulletin, this time for carbon nanotubes and fibers. Toxicological data showed increasing pulmonary inflammation and fibrosis with dose 2 carbon nanotubes and fibers. It also showed evidence that carbon nanotube exposure may promote or initiate cancer, the first stage of which is depicted in the figure at right. In this figure, a carbon nanotube is poking through the lung into the pleural space. This type of action is the hallmark of cancer initiation by asbestos particles. They then recommended an exposure limit of one microgram per meter cubed, or 0.001 milligram per meter cubed, measured as elemental carbon. This limit was not only based on adverse health effects, but also on the limit of detecting elemental carbon on air samples. So here I've added to the list of example OELs relevant to nanotechnology. Again, I show the permissible exposure limit, along with a new column, the recommended exposure limit from NIOSH. NIOSH does not have a recommended exposure limit for particles not otherwise regulated, so the OSHA value is used. In many cases, the REL is the same as the PEL. For the CIBs that have recently been issued, there are substantial changes. For TiO2, the OSHA PEL for particles not otherwise regulated applies, 15 milligrams per meter cubed, whereas the new recommended exposure limit is almost 10 times lower for fine and 50 times lower for ultrafine particles. For carbon nanotubes, the OSHA permissible exposure limit again applies 15 milligrams per meter cubed, whereas the new REL is 0.001 milligram per meter cubed, or 15,000 times lower. And now let's turn our attention to 
the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists. They started out as a group that was limited to government employees, and now their membership is open and there is representation from academics to professionals to government employees. There are committees within ACGIH that review and revise threshold limit values, TLVs. TLVs are health-based consensus occupational exposure limits. TLVs are based on the concept of threshold. They represent conditions under which nearly all workers may be repeatedly exposed day after day without adverse health effects. Note the use of the word condition because it could be one of the many ways to measure a workplace hazard. Noise in decibels, gas concentration in PPB, particle concentration in milligrams per meter cubed. These limits may not be adequate for individuals hyper susceptible to substances. TLVs are intended for use in the practice of industrial hygiene as guidelines in the control of hazards. They should only be used by persons trained in the discipline of industrial hygiene and only after becoming familiar with the basis should one use an occupational exposure limit for controlling exposures. In other words, you need to know more than just the limit. There are several key resources from ACGIH that are published each year. The first is a spiral bound booklet with the latest threshold limit values and BEIs, biological exposure indices. The second is a guide to occupational exposure values, which in addition to TLVs provides permissible exposure limits, recommended exposure limits, and German standards, MAKs. Having all of these values side by side is helpful to setting internal workplace occupational exposure limits. The last is documentation of the TLVs and BEIs. The documentation is extremely useful. For each substance, there is documentation explaining how the ACGIH committee decided on the particular TLV or BEI value, including a discussion of where the substance is used in industry, a summary of epidemiological and toxicological information upon which the value is based. Here I show a page from the spiral bound TLV and BEI booklet. Here we can see that for titanium dioxide, the TWA threshold limit value is 10 milligrams per meter cubed. There is no short term exposure limit. The notation of A4 means not classifiable as a human carcinogen, interpreted as there is a concern, but epi and tox data are not conclusive. The last column shows us the basis for this TLV is lower respiratory tract irritation, LRT irritation. Here is another page from this booklet, which I will use to discuss some important footnotes. A1 through A5 indicates varying levels of human carcinogenicity, where A1 is a confirmed human carcinogen and A5 is not suspected as a human carcinogen. BEI means that there is a biological exposure indice for this substance. Skin means that there is danger of cutaneous absorption or dermal absorption. C means that the value is a ceiling limit. IFV means that the value is for inhalable fraction and vapor. I means inhalable. T means thoracic. And R means respirable. And we'll talk more about that in the sampling lecture. ACGIH has TLVs for particles not otherwise specified, called PNOS. These TLVs are analogous to PELs for particles not otherwise regulated from OSHA. 
They apply to insoluble or poorly soluble particles without an applicable TLV and low toxicity. The TLVs are 3 mg per meter cubed for respirable and 10 mg per meter cubed for inhalable particles. So here I've added to the list again of example OELs relevant to nanotechnology. So here I show the PEL from OSHA, the REL from NIOSH, and I add a new column with the TLV from ACGIH. In many cases you'll find that all of these values are the same and then in other situations there are differences. The booklet of TLVs and BEIs from ACGIH also has a section called Notice of Intended Changes. This section importantly identifies substances for which new limits have been set. These may be for new substances or for lowering or changing of threshold limit values. A biological exposure index, or BEI, represents a concentration of a substance in blood or urine below which no adverse health effects are expected. BEIs should correlate with occupational exposure limits. They should not be used as a primary or sole means of evaluating the effectiveness of exposure controls. I want to show one more important, very useful document. OSHA offers what they call annotated tables. It is a one-stop shopping place for occupational exposure limits that I want to make you aware of. If I click on this link, I'll find the online version of the annotated table Z1. And so if I scroll down through this website, again I'm back at the OSHA website, and I go down, I see this annotated table Z1. So I can go to the list of footnotes, which is at the bottom. I've got a nice hyperlink for that. I have the substance. I have the cast number. I have the OSHA PEL in ppm and milligrams per meter cubed. I've got the NIOSH REL. And then I also have the ACGIH TLV. And so it's all in one place. And for a bonus, we also get the Cal OSHA, California OSHA permissible exposure limit. You can go and compare these things right online. Here I show an example for manganese fume. This substance has dramatically different occupational exposure limits. The OSHA PEL is 5 milligrams per meter cubed as a ceiling level. The NIOSH RELs are 1 milligram per meter cubed as a time weighted average and 3 milligrams per meter cubed as a short term exposure limit. The ACGIH in contrast, TLVs are much lower, 0.02 milligrams per meter cubed for respirable particles and 0.1 milligram per meter cubed for inhalable particles. Here I provide a very brief history of exposure limits in the US. The first ACGIH, MAC, or Maximum Allowable Concentration, was put forth in 1946. In 1948, the name MAC was changed to Threshold Limit Value, or TLV. In 1971, OSHA adopted the ACGIH's 1968 TLVs as their own permissible exposure limits. In 1989, OSHA updated the permissible exposure limits, lowering them for 212 substances and raising one. OSHA also added permissible exposure limits for 164 new substances. These updates were challenged in court. As a result, OSHA had to throw out all of the revisions. They decided to use the general duty clause for recognizing hazards for which there is no permissible exposure limit. Some states have permissible exposure limits that they enforce for these compounds. 
Today, NIOSH has published recommended exposure limits for 667 substances. ACGIH has about 900 threshold limit values. Most large companies develop internal occupational exposure limits based on a combination of TLVs and other worldwide occupational exposure limits. OSHA tries to update PELs but continually gets hampered by lawsuits. Progress is very slow. There are other organizations that offer occupational exposure limits, including ANSI, the American National Standards Institute, the American Industrial Hygiene Association, or AIHA, the National Fire Protection Agency, the Environmental Protection Agency, and other countries in the European Union have their own agencies. Now I'm going to turn our attention to the practical use of occupational exposure limits. I'm going to talk about sampling only a portion of a work shift, adjusting an OEL for an extended work shift, and then exposure limits for mixtures. Here are some exposure measurements that are fairly typical. Say we measured personal exposure to a hazardous gas three times during a work shift. The exposure was 50 ppm during the first 100 minutes of the work shift starting at 7 a.m. Then it took 20 minutes to get the next sample running, so we have a data gap before we measured 18 ppm for 140 minutes. Then we have no data for lunch, and then we measured 15 ppm for 200 minutes in the afternoon. What do we do with the data gaps, and how do we relate these measurements to an 8-hour TLV? Recall the equation for time-weighted average, which is simply the sum of the concentration times time divided by the total time sampled. We put in our measurements in that equation, and we calculate 24 ppm. So this is simply an arithmetic average of the measurements that we took. But the total time is only 440 minutes. 8 hours is 8 times 60 minutes, and that's 480 minutes for an 8-hour day. So we're missing 40 minutes. Is that important? Well, maybe. We need to assume something for the 40-minute period with no data. Option 1 is to assume that there was no exposure. That's the best case. Option 2 use the average exposure for the rest of the work shift. Option three, use the highest exposure, and that's the worst case. So if I do that, we'll go through and say, okay, option one, we're gonna take and say, all right, I measured 50 ppm for 100 minutes, 18 for 140 minutes, 15 for 200 minutes, and then for the last missing 40 minutes, I'm gonna put in a zero here. So here's my added time. These three are what I actually measured, and then I divide by 8 hours or 480 minutes. And so what I get is 22 ppm. That is the best case exposure because I assumed zero for the missing time, which might not be a bad assumption given that most of that time was during lunch. Option two I'm going to take, and I'm going to assume the average these are my data that I collected, 50 ppm for 100 minutes, 18 ppm for 140, 15 ppm for 200 minutes, and then I'm going to take the average exposure and use 24 times the 40 minutes, and then again divide by that 480 minutes. So here I would get 24 ppm as my uh, time-weighted average. The last one is to assume the worst case. And so here, I've got, again, my 50 ppm, 18 ppm, 15 ppm. These are what I actually measured. And then I'm going to use, for that missing 40 minutes, the highest concentration. So here's 50 ppm for the remaining 40 minutes. And I divide by my 480, 8 hours of measurement, and I get 26 ppm. Here I summarize these results for different options. 
22 ppm for the best case, 24 ppm for the average, 26 ppm for the peak. Not a big deal unless the occupational exposure limit is 25 ppm. So it is important to know what went on during the sampling period and to make a good assumption. If the missing time was, for instance, during lunch in a cafeteria with little chance of exposure, then assuming zero is probably a good assumption. This issue becomes more problematical with less time sampled. What about extended work shifts? Permissible exposure limits are based on a worker who works eight hours per day, five days a week. How do I adjust the limit for a worker who's working 10 hours per day? There's what's called the OSHA model, which allows the calculation of a modified occupational exposure limit by multiplying the eight hour occupational exposure limit by the ratio of eight hours divided by the actual time that that person works. So for this example, I calculate the modified occupational exposure limit to be 15 milligrams per meter cubed. That's the permissible exposure limit for particles not otherwise regulated times eight hours divided by 10 hours. And I get the modified OEL is 12 milligrams per meter cubed. So the OEL is lower for a worker who works longer hours. And that makes sense because their body doesn't have as much time to recover. There are other models which are outside the scope of this lecture. You can go to this link to take a look at them. What if a worker is exposed to a mixture of chemicals, which is common? First, you need to identify chemicals that have the same target organ and effect. Then, identify the occupational exposure limit for each chemical measure the exposure concentration for each chemical, determine the fraction of the OEL for a combination of chemicals as F subscript OEL using this equation. If the fraction of the OEL is greater than one, then you have an exposure that's likely to cause health effects. So you have a problem and need to reduce exposures. Here we consider an example of mixed exposures for a worker at a dip tank used to clean parts before painting. We measured exposures for nitric acid, sulfuric acid, and tributyl phosphate, and all were less than the threshold limit value, TLV. Now let's consider how to handle substances that affect similar target organs. Nitric acid and sulfuric acid both affect the respiratory tract, whereas tributyl phosphate affects the bladder. So we should consider the combined effects for nitric and sulfuric acid as shown in the equation. We calculate the fraction of the OEL, F subscript OEL, to be 1.12, which is greater than 1. So we have a problem even though both exposures were less than the threshold limit value. Because tributyl phosphate acts on a separate organ, the bladder, we consider that substance apart from the acids. So the exposure for tributyl phosphate is lower than the threshold limit. So we don't need to deal with tributyl phosphate, but we do need to deal with reducing exposures to the nitric and sulfuric acid. Finally, let's discuss how to interpret the results of the measurements that we make. Say that we measure a time-weighted average exposure that is lower than the permissible exposure limit. We need to compute confidence intervals of our measurements per the website given here. And we get a 95 percentile upper confidence limit and we get a 95 percentile lower confidence limit. So in this case, the time-weighted average and confidence intervals are below the occupational exposure limit, so we are in compliance. No citation from OSHA. Is the employee safe? Well, it depends on how close you are to the limit. As I said before, I try and shoot for being lower than 10% of the occupational exposure limit. All measurements are below 10% of the occupational exposure limit, then I'm fairly confident that I will not have a problem. What about here? 
The time weighted average exposure is below the occupational exposure limit, but the tails extend above the occupational exposure limit. So some of the population may be exposed to high concentrations. No citation is issued, but we should look at that exposure and see if we can't do a better job. I'm a little bit worried about that. Here, exposure is above the OEL, but there is some chance that the exposure is actually below the line. Hence, there is no citation from OSHA, but you should control the exposure as most often it is above the line. Finally, if the exposure and both tails are above the permissible exposure limit, OSHA can give a citation and there is a health hazard risk. So you really need to control the exposure in this situation. The American Industrial Hygiene Association provides a way to interpret exposures using an exposure banding model. This model is based on taking multiple measurements of exposure and the 95th percentile of exposures is indicated as X subscript 0.95. That value is the value for which 95% of the measurements are less than if the 95th percentile exposure is less than 1% of the occupational exposure limit, then I have a low exposure control rating of zero and need no action. As the 95th percentile exposure approaches and exceeds the OEL, I have a higher exposure control rating and need to consider controlling the exposure and also implementing engineering controls, work practices, potential medical surveillance as the exposures get higher. These are the key resources that I've referred to in this presentation. They include OSHA methods and permissible exposure limits. There are the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods, the NIOSH Pocket Guide, Equipment Manuals, Procedures and Assignments, and then finally, articles are important to be able to go find on your own, and I recommend Google Scholar for that. So to summarize, there are several key agencies and organizations that provide occupational exposure limits. OELs are established to protect workers from the development of acute and chronic adverse health outcomes. OELs are based on epidemiological and toxicological data we reviewed where you can find these occupational exposure limits, and we also discussed how you can apply these occupational exposure limits to assess exposure risks. This lesson has been created by the Midwest Emerging Technologies Public Health and Safety Training METFAST program, a collaboration of the University of Minnesota School of Public Health, the University of Iowa College of Public Health, and Dakota County Technical College. Funding for the METFAST program is provided by the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences of the National Institutes of Health. The content of this lesson is solely the responsibility of the developers and does not necessarily represent the official views of National Institutes of Health.